My name is Thorsten Orgard. I'm a Danish photographer. I travel the world taking photographs and teaching workshops. Today I will talk about film and the new Leica M6 that have come back from the... <laughs> I don't know where it came from, but here it is. Today it is all about film and before I get into it, Below the video there is a free ebook you can download, you just click on it, you put in your name and then in a matter of minutes you get an ebook that I've written about iconic photographs and iconic photographers. And I also write about how I take photos and why I take photos. Also today there's free Leica presets that you can use for any, well actually any digital camera to make a special look that you could say it's going to be the like a look. Also below the video, click on it, put in your name and you have it in a few minutes and you can use it in Capture One or in Lightroom. So if you are busy now checking your calendar and uh, you watch for what uh, century you're in, uh, you're not wrong. It is uh, 2022 October where Leica came out with the Leica M6 film camera. But that is not the first time the Leica M6 came out, uh, the film camera. It actually came out in uh, 84 the first time and it went on for uh, quite a number of years. It went on till 2003 and then Leica said, okay, let's stop production of the Leica M6. Uh, and they went on with Leica M7 and you could say kind of already in 2003 most would know that film is going to die. Um, but what do you know? Film is not dead and here we have the Leica M6 again. This is <laughs> the 100% retro experience. This is the actual box that the Leica M6 comes in and I don't do unboxing videos but I just want to show how uh, retro this is. Uh, you will notice that this doesn't say Leica, it says lights and that is uh, you can say the original logo for Leica cameras and also on the box and even on the camera it has a lights logo. Um, and then it comes in a box like this uh, just like it did in the 80s and in here is uh, some battery, the manual, well I'll show you the manual because that's also a piece of, uh, of retro. Uh, I think it's so nice that I actually printed the one from uh, the Leica website um, to not ruin this one. But this is like totally like the original uh, manual. Uh, the strap is a newer version, it's a leather one. Uh, I made my own uh, strap for the Leica M6 or the Leica M film cameras and the Leica Q. Uh, if you know my straps, always wear a camera, they're called. Then this one is uh, a little bit more compact, it's not as wide as the other ones and that's the idea for, I think, for a film camera and for the Leica Q. You can still get both. Um, but this is uh, the box and it even comes with uh, a battery which is great. You buy a camera and it's nice you can get going. And I actually did uh, just to make sure that I have enough batteries. I went on Amazon and bought a package here with uh, I cut out one but it has five batteries. It's like $10 or something. It's not even it's an old camera. It uses current batteries and there's two types of batteries. You can use two small batteries and stack them together or you can use just one. And let me just, if you wonder where does the battery sit, well it sits here uh, behind this one and I'll tell you later why it has a battery and what it does and this is the battery. So here's where it sits. Um, and now that I'm talking the battery there's one thing is like this battery cover used to, you can say the great thing about the Leica M6 is that we have uh, a lot of experience, many years experience in using this camera. Uh, so one thing we know is that this uh, cover for the battery can get lost. So the new Leica M6 actually comes with two of them, uh, a spare one. You can get them but you could say if you're out in the field in Africa or somewhere and you lose your battery cover, it's nice that you have uh, a backup in the back. What is so great with film? Well, it is uh, history and I would say that until a few months ago 
I was done with film. I was one that converted late from film to digital, uh, actually around 2006-2008. That was when I could get a look from digital sensors that I thought this is just as good as film and then I went digital. So that's very late. Some people went uh, digital already in the 90s with the first Nikon one megapixel cameras and stuff. Uh, so I was very late and since then I have had well, I still have uh, 12, 14 film cameras in the closet in there and I don't feel like using them. And they're beautiful. Uh, here is like uh, one of the first ones I had. Uh, this is a mini looks, it's an autofocus. Uh, like a camera, it's amazing. Uh, it goes like this autofocus and it takes a photo and then you can pack it down and just put it in the pocket. Amazing uh, 40 millimeter lens on it. Uh, my, one of my favorite cameras uh, to use or film has been the Leica Flex. So this is actually the first uh, Leica uh, SLR camera that Leica came with. Um, <clears throat> so I have a couple of these and these have really traveled around the world me, with me. And just to list, listen to the, the, shot of the, so the sound of the shot. That's how it sounds. It is built like a tank and this is probably the SLR camera in the world that comes closest to a Leica M. This uh, feeling of something that is really well built uh, and also very acoustic and very analog and very simple. So I love this and I've used uh, a lot of film cameras. And the interesting thing is when when Leica said we're going to make it like an M6 again, it's like, are you for real? And first the idea was, no, it's going to be limited, only 500 of them. So I thought, that's great, I'll buy two, one to use, one to sell at a higher price later. Uh, when it was actually released, Leica had changed their mind, or maybe it was always the idea that it's not going to be limited. So now you actually have three Leica film cameras in production. You have the M6. You have the Leica MP and you have the KE or KA or whatever it's called. I can never remember the name of it. Um, <clears throat> and that's, that's when it's kind of unusual that you have a producer of uh, cameras today that also make film cameras. And truth be told, the MP, the two existing Leica film cameras have been really difficult to get. And for, I think for the last one or two years, it's almost like impossible to get it. Maybe there was one coming here and there. Um, before that particular, if you went to Tokyo and you went into the Leica store in Tokyo, they would have all the digital Leica cameras on display, but they would also have the Leica MP. Uh, and you could say Japan is very special in the way, or Asia. Uh, well, some place in the world there's just a lot of film studios, but in, in Tokyo in particular, it's like, no, you can get a like a film camera and there's a lot of attention on film. So anyways, this comes out and I actually get really enthusiastic. And you could say, <clears throat> I got so enthusiastic that I actually went into my camera closet and grabbed some of my uh, film cameras. Well, I took out the SL for one and I took out also this one and I have some uh, R4 and, and other cameras. And then uh, I put film on them and I was really looking forward to this, which is kind of strange. Um, and then I kind of hit a wall because I thought, oh no, now to shoot the film I have to send them somewhere to get them developed, which in basically I could, I mean in the US, you just go on Amazon and you order some darkroom equipment and you can develop your own films. You can get all the stuff in a day or two and then you can read the manual, you can develop your films. But then comes the next thing, then you have to scan the film or you have to build a dark room. And it's kind of like, ah, I don't really want to do that because that was one of the great things but, but from going from uh, slide film and uh, negative film to digital. It's like suddenly you could go out, you could photograph something, you go home, you edit it, you deliver, you're done. Whereas with the uh, slide film, first you have to go uh, buy the film, enough of it, you have to take it with you through airports and what have you. And then when you get back, you have to send it to the lab and then depending on what kind of lab you use, it takes an hour or a day or two before you get the film back. And then you have to do something with it and you have to scan it. And I've had uh, Emacon scanners, Nikon scanners and what have you. Uh, so that part was not something I was looking forward to, 
But then I found uh, a solution. So when I had to get back into film, I was trying to solve this, how can I get this workflow to work in a way that so it becomes productive and not some hobby, hobby horse, uh, difficult stuff. And actually I found that in uh, most places in the world, uh, you will find places where they will develop and scan your film. For example, in New York, that's the one I use, is Picture House and the little dark room or little dark room picture lab or whatever it's called. Um, I'll put a link below the video. They, you send a film to them and then they will develop it and they will scan it in 30 megapixel uh, sizes each picture and then you get a download link via WeTransfer. So you simply just get a link by email, you click on it, you download your pictures, they're clean for dust and everything, uh, they're like almost as perfect as digital and then later they will send the original uh, film back to you or you can get it cut or you can get it in rolls doesn't matter, it just goes into the archive. And this is something uh, with them right now, it's like $30, you send 36 pictures, develop and scanning, $36. Similar service exists in London, in uh, Tokyo, Hong Kong, I would say all over the world you can find uh, places where maybe you can't walk in there but then at least you can send it to them and then you will get a link back. So that solves all this because I did look at I mean, I sold my Imacon scanner. I had a dedicated Imacon scanner that's like state-of-the-art scanner. Um, I actually also have a whole Leica or Lights dark room that I never set up, that I could set up. I'm like, I don't feel like this. This is not what I like about film. So I also looked at what else can you do and, and you can do stuff like, like this. You can get like a scan box like this and I'll show you. And, and as I dive down to it, I actually find out I have quite a few things. This is, uh, I'll show you. So, one of the things I had was I felt like I'm new to film. I never tried it before. And then, like, <laughs> no, that's not true. It's just a long time since uh, I did it. So, I kind of uh, forgot that I have uh, quite a huge archive of uh, pictures I did. Uh, and I shot many slides. And you can see this is my film archive. And this, the, the envelope here has a number and then each uh, strip that I scanned has the number of the film roll and the number of the picture. Uh, so this, if I go look at this one and say, oh, this is this number, I can actually go search on the computer and I have to scan of this one. Uh, so this is something I've done a lot of. I spend a lot of time, uh, probably also a lot of money, on doing this workflow. And that is not the part of it that I miss. I mean, it's cozy. Uh, I will say this is addictive, I mean the, the smell of film, even the smell of dark room, the whole atmosphere of it is great, but that's not really what I want to go back to. So one of the things you can do is you can, you can get a film box like this, so it's a kit, so you see here, uh, this is a lot of light, it's really strong, but you'll see here you can put a 4 five, four times 5 inch negatives in, there's different frame holders and this is the 35 millimeter. And then what I would do is I would take the film here and then you put it in here and then you have your frame here and it's really evenly light and strong light and then you make a camera setup with a tripod. You can get the whole kit with it, but it's like I have my own tripod, so I don't need to buy a tripod. And you set up a camera here. You say, for example, this is 47 megapixel. Then you make a 47 megapixel uh, picture of this, and then it's digitized. Very easy. You still have to deal with if there's hair and dust or scratches. Um, but this is doable, and there's a lot of different uh, systems of these. Um, and I also found that uh, I actually have like this, this is even a Leica uh, thing to, to look at slides. So you can put it in here and then you can look at the pictures uh, really close. And I actually also have uh, somewhere I have a light table. So that's like, a, you could say a big light box like this one uh, where it's a lot of lights. You can put out a lot of uh, film and slides and look at them with a loop and you can mark them and everything and, and organize your stuff. Uh, different stuff, but you could say there is a uh, simple solution to it these days and that is just you put this in the mail and then 
a day or three days later, you get a download link. And that's uh, the way I decided to do it. And that is part of how I can be enthusiastic about shooting film again. So the experience I had with going back into film was, I'm going to find some film. And there's actually a lot of uh, different things. Here's one is uh, Cine Still, and that is like uh, very much the hype now. Uh, this film, and you can get both uh, daylight film, and you can also get for tungsten. So that means like indoor artificial light, um, which is kind of uh, I would say a new thing. It, it always existed, but it wasn't used a lot, and now they kind of made it popular. Uh, of course, there is uh, Kodak. The classic Kodak, uh, there's Ilford here, um, also a classic, and I bought some uh, really fast Ilford. A lot of the stuff I have, this is 3200 ISO Ilford, and Kodak also makes some amazing 3200 ISO with amazing, beautiful grain. Um, I would say mostly I'll put in a 400 ISO uh, film because that means I can actually get away with shooting indoor. Uh, and low light indoor at night and low light in the evening. If I want to shoot really night, I go 3200, but 400, I mean, one of the problems is you put in a roll of film and then there's 36 pictures before you can change it. You can actually look here and say, okay, oh, this is a number 18 or 22 picture. And you can roll the film up, put it back, put in another film, and then you can put back the film that you had shot 18 pictures of and you just make sure that it's black here and then you just expose it till you get to, to frame number 19 again or 20 and you can shoot the rest of it or you just send the 18 pictures for development. So that's kind of like a different uh, thing. But, and you can say one of the beautiful things about it, there's a lot of really interesting things, I'll get into it in a moment, there's a lot of interesting things with shooting film and one of, this, one of them is the simplicity. And for example, I was driving uh, over to a juice and a coffee place and I drive down the street and I'm like, that's a, that's a picture. And I immediately start thinking, okay, what's the Kelvin, what is the ISO? And then like, oh, it doesn't matter. This is the M6. There is no Kelvin. There's film. I mean, with color film, most color film is set for 5,300 Kelvin. That means daylight. That's how color film always was. So this thing, you can change the Kelvin or you have outer white bands and all this stuff on a digital camera. Forget about it. There is no outer anything. It's just there's only one setting. And so you don't have to worry about it. Uh, and in terms of the ISO, it doesn't really matter because you can't change the ISO. I already had it in the film. I had 160 uh, ISO portrait, portrait film in there. So that's what I'm shooting with. And then comes the moment you could say, that you take the picture and I had people I gave this camera to said, hey, try and take a photo and then they go like this and, and you set the focus and blah, blah, blah. And then that's all it says. There's no sound after. There's just the click and then of course you have to rewind. Um, this ultimate simplicity is something that gets to you and you could say, talking about a decisive moment in photography, there is no other decision, you just take the picture, there's nothing else you have to set or anything, you just, what you get is what you get. And you can say each film have a certain look, uh, they can be high contrast or they can be soft contrast in black and white, or they can be color, they can be muted or beautiful skin tone or something, that is the look that you have. And one of the things I had, you could say I get the film back from the lab, uh, <clears throat> my scene is still, it looks fairly close to final. Uh, my Ilford is very grey and grey and different things you could say one of the beautiful things about a film is that it has a certain look and that's where you go with it. Uh, and you have lots of photographers that in the 80s, 90s and so on they had a certain look and that was based on that they shot this film with this camera and they had this dark work. So that all the stuff looked that special look that they, had, they have developed with chemistry and materials. Uh, and with digital it suddenly become very like how do you get back into that and now you can do so many things. And the great thing about film is you can't really do that much. But then again that's not really true because you could say when you get the files back from the lab you download them and I'll put them into Capture One mainly, sometimes Lightroom. 
and then I saw a need for, okay, I need to fix these things. But it's kind of like the same, I have to fix on all of them. So I made a, a preset package for Capture One and also for Lightroom, how to deal with Ilford film and how to deal with uh, Porta film and how to deal with Cine still and so on. Uh, and, and it just makes it very easy, it's just almost one click. I have the picture, I have different looks, so I can go between four or five different looks for the Ilford, for example. But one of them is going to be the one that's what I'm going to go with. There's not so much more to consider, that is the final picture. Uh, and while I was at it, as I said, okay, that's actually interesting. Let's see these, some of these uh, presets and styles can also be made. So I take a digital file, for, from, for example, from the M11, and then I give it a preset, and now it looks like portrait, or now it looks like Ilford, or it gets grain and so on. So it's kind of like, once film gets into you, it really gets into you. Below the video there is a link where you can go look at the, the presets and styles I made. And I actually also, I just got inspired, I wrote a little book that is called Film is Not Dead. And that is about my film experience and how to work with film. And it's based on, you could say, the experience I used to have and then we're experiencing film today. So when I went out with uh, a film camera again, I, I went around New York for a few days as the first thing. And I was a little bit like, oh dear, what do I do? Uh, because now I can't see the picture right after I took it. It's going to take days and I, I have no idea what, I'm, what, what is this going to look like. And it's kind of like funny that I had the same experience when I first got the Leica MD262, that's like the Leica digital camera with outer screen on the back. And back then, uh, I was almost scared to take it out because like, I don't know what I'm doing. And what I realized after I used it for half, the first half day, I looked and it's like, no, I know what I'm doing. I actually don't need the screen. Uh, the things that I do and, and what I know, it works pretty well. For this, I don't need a screen to check it all the time. With film, even worse, uh, and you can say one thing you can do is, uh, you can say all photographs are about exposure, so like, it's a, all a camera is for is to get the correct exposure. So you see a street and you want to take a picture of the street, so it cannot be blown out wide and it cannot be so dark, it has to have the correct exposure. It's extremely important for all the colors, all the tones, skin tones, details, everything. Uh, and that is why you have the controls on a camera that you have uh, the shutter speed, the aperture, and you have the ISO of the film. Those are the three elements, also known as the exposure pyramid, to get the correct exposure. And that's all this control is just for that thing, and you can say there's only one correct exposure of anything. They can make artistic choice to make it brighter or darker or harder contrast, softer contrast, black or white or color, whatever. But fundamentally, there's only one correct exposure, and that is. When you look at the picture, it looks like when you look at something with the eyes, because your eyes adjust for the correct exposure all the time. If you go in sunshine or it's dark, you can see things like they're supposed to be. So that is the exposure. And one thing you can do, uh, and which I used uh, always with film, is external light meter. Uh, so this is a light meter where uh, you set the aperture here, for example, 2.0, 200 ISO, and then you hold it in front of the shop, you do a photograph and say, if I was taking a photo of a person here, I would go here and say, okay, shutter speed is going to be 19th of a second. And then I would set the camera for 19th of a second, and then I'll take the photo. And it would be correct. Um, so I thought, okay, um, I did bring my light meter, but I didn't bring it out to the street. What I did instead was say, okay, actually, this is great. I have here Leica M11. Um, and I put on a 50 on this one and a 50 millimeter lens on this one, so the frame was the same. Then I said, okay, the great thing about this camera is here I can set it to 400 ISO, and then um, I can go, okay, shutter speed here, daylight, okay, I'm gonna go 1,000 of a second, that's the maximum on the M6, and I'm gonna go 1,000 of a second here. So now the settings are the same. And if the f2.0 lens, I set this one f2.0 and this one, this is 28mm on this one, but I had a 50 on this one. And then I'll go look at how does it look here, okay, I'll focus here, and then I would go, okay, 
this is the correct aperture and now we look at it okay that is 5.6 and then I'll go 5.6 with this one and then I'll take the picture with this one so I basically used my digital element uh, as light meter and also to preview the frame and almost like you used to do with Polaroid it's not so much you did it with Polaroids with uh, these cameras uh, you could get Polaroid bags for like a R4 and so on but mainly medium format and large format cameras in studios or even outdoor you would set it up and you would measure the light with a light meter and everything and then you would take a test photo on a Polaroid uh, and then you would wait 20, 30, whatever seconds and then the Polaroid would be ready, you look at it and you check the frame and everything nothing is in the picture, it shouldn't be there and so on and you check the exposure and when you had done one, two, three, five Polaroids and you had, okay, this is how it's supposed to look you stayed with those settings and that light and then you took the actual photo on film, you would put in a film instead uh, so that's kind of how I used this as my Polaroid and some of the pictures I took both uh, M11 and also uh, with film uh, which is interesting of course after to compare and see if I had only shot digital how would it look like or if I had only shot film how would it look like and sometimes you can't it's almost like you can't tell what the difference is doesn't matter the whole point with shooting film is well, it's a feeling, so it's a little bit, uh, you know, like I have made monochrome cameras, the light made the Leica M9 monochrome in 2012 as the first one, and since they made different versions, and one of the latest one is the Leica Q2 uh, monochrome, oops, I have one here, I'll show you, uh, so this is a very uh, easy to use camera, and it's 47 megapixel, a pixel and it comes normally with a color sensor but they also made a black and white one and why on earth would anybody uh, want a black and white camera? well you could tell yourself that it's about the quality you have more tones, you have more details and blah blah blah, blah when you shoot with a monochrome sensor and to some degree that's true but if anybody will ever notice it's uh, doubtful other than yourself because you know that this is a monochrome uh, sensor you used the point of it is, the point of having a monochrome camera is you just go out and you don't care about colors you are photographing monochrome and that's a really beautiful thing to add or you could say remove from your photography you get simplicity out with the colors and that's what you do and it's a little bit the same when you take a film camera you have 36 pictures uh, it's either Kodak, black and white 400 ISO, maybe it's Sinistil Colors, maybe it's Porter with muted colors. Um, that's the look you're getting. And that's kind of like it puts you in, of course, a completely different mindset. Um, and that is the beauty of shooting film, or you could say pick any camera. So, a very interesting thing when I was photographing in uh, New York I mean it's like I literally felt like I had never shot film before that's how virgin or uncertain I felt I really had uh, forgotten that I have shot many thousands of slide and black and white film and I've been working in my own dark room and blah de blah um, but so, so one thing I noticed was um, like I was driving from Midtown to Uptown uh, for 20 minutes and I look out the window of the car and I also take some pictures out of the window when we stopped and so on um, and it was late afternoon and I just suddenly suddenly the light and the colors came alive in a different way that it haven't been like that with digital for ever maybe um, and that's kind of very interesting because suddenly I admire light and texture and the materials, the colors of things in a different way and it's something you can try for yourself and see what happens but what I sense is like no it gives a dis different enthusiasm for for taking photographs in some way it's also maybe if I look at uh, well I look at my own photos 
Now, if you look at my own photos from back when I started photographing, if I look at other people shooting film versus people who shoot digital, there seems to be almost uh, a moment where you just you have a film on the camera, and just the f just, just the fact that you can photograph something, you can capture it, is enough. So sometimes <laughs> you can end up with pictures that are kind of like a little bit pointless except they have a great mood and they have colors and you took them, you took a photo. And, and if, we, if we go like, so okay, so when I shot film, I would use external light meter and there's, I would set up things and it would be beautiful. And I kind of have this memory of film as it's very grainy, it's a little bit blurry, it's not as accurate and blah, blah, blah. And that's not true. I mean, if I go back and look at high resolution scans of my film photos, they're like same level or higher than digital and they have something extra to them. So you can totally work with precision in film photography. And when I went from film to digital, life became easier. Suddenly I didn't have to go to the lab, I didn't have to transport film around the world and, and get the right film and blah, blah blah and look at the date if it's too old and all this stuff. Um, suddenly I could just take photos and I could take 50 extras if I wanted to, I could take 200 extra photos if I wanted to and then the ones that I liked I could just select. And you could say that is like a sliding thing that you get into with digital that it becomes, you can just take pictures. Which is great because I mean, yeah, it's great you can take 200 photos and just one of them is the one you need. The others just test or whatever. Um, but then when I return to film it becomes it becomes very serious, it's like, it's not that serious, I mean, um, but it is serious in the way like, no, I take a picture when the timing is right, when the light is right, the settings are right. We're just not taking a photo and then see if it works. No, I take a photo and I want to make sure that it actually does work, uh, high percentage. And if I look at uh, the film I get back from the lab, I would say it is like 60% uh, plus minus. 60% of the pictures on the film roll is final pictures that I actually will finalize, keyword and put in the archive. Um, and I never talk about hit rate. People will ask in my workshops, like, what's your hit rate? Like it's like, it's not about hit rate. If you take photos, it's not about how many photos do you take to make one good. I mean, if you take two photos or one photo or 20 or 200 photos to get one good photo, it doesn't really matter as long as you make the one good photo. But it is interesting to see that if I normally have a hit rate that maybe I edit 10 to 30 percent of the pictures I take on digital, on film it's 60 percent. So that gives an idea how precise or how serious I am about taking the photo and you could say it's also interesting and it was fun that in New York I would just take first photo with this one and I look at it and I could kind of correct and then now I could take the real camera. And I thought about what is this thing and it's almost, um, if you think about it like painters used to uh, make sketches, sometimes you would read about painters that they spent like three months making sketches and study how to make a painting um, and then they made the painting. And that is a little bit maybe in the same way that digital and film is that when you take a film camera you already fought through all the sketches, you are making a painting. Whereas digital very often becomes you just like sketching, sketching, sketching. And you could say the important thing in, in digital is that now and then you should make a real painting. Um, it doesn't mean anything, you could say what it means for me is just like no, that's what I get from this, that I see texture and light different and I appreciate it and I appreciate the whole medium that you can actually take a picture of things and you have a position that what you see is the same as you get or what you see gets to look in a certain way because you use this film or you use this film and the whole workflow around it helps you create something that is very unique. In a way uh, there is also a thing about film and taking photographs with this that maybe it's meant to be that I get back into film now and maybe you will get back into film uh, more in a different way 
and that is um, when I looked at the light and the colors and the textures and the movement and the people uh, and the architecture and everything and the reflections and stuff and like wow this is beautiful I want to photograph it so I kind of saw things in a new way but also more physical and that actually makes sense that you say that film is a very uh, analog medium I mean this is like uh, this is a piece of physical. The light actually, the colors and everything sits on uh, this piece of plastic. Whereas with digital, it's like, you know, we have a memory card here uh, somewhere. Uh, and this one you don't even have to put in a memory card, it has a built in memory. So here you have the pictures and then you put them on the hard drives. And you could say the output on a screen or on a piece of paper can be the same. It's kind of like you can't really tell the difference, maybe. but but there is something about working analog and work with a, a piece of physical material that it kind of makes sense here. You have here the physical world, you take a photo of the physical world and it ends up on a physical thing here. Uh, there's some solid connection there that I think it's great to experience again. I mean, today we deal with, I mean, not even our money is physical anymore, it's just uh, electronics, numbers on a screen uh, that we pay with. And uh, we sit and like uh, pictures online uh, that people we never met and maybe never will meet took and put on a digital medium and it just floats around and in 10 minutes nobody cares because now here's a new picture. Um, in that whole context, having a piece of film that is going to last for hundreds of years and you can take it here, you can give it to your kids and they can give it to the grandkids. There's something about this that is just a different mindset that maybe uh, is something I need and maybe we all need uh, right now. And then of course you wonder, is he not going to review on uh, the Leica M6? And I mean there's actually not much to say about it. Uh, the deal with this camera um, I have on my website, and there's a link below, I have a whole website about the Leica M6, uh, the story of it, and all the versions that have been through the time. And it's not, well, there haven't been a lot of limited versions and special editions, but the main thing is the first Leica M6 that came out, the only difference is that uh, the first one had a lights logo here and had a small uh, shutter speed dial like this one. Um, and then later Leica made a version, uh, TTL, which means through the lens, so that's the light metering. Uh, but they're all TTLs, it doesn't really matter. So it's kind of like the same version that have been made all the time and it's the same version again here with a few changes and improvements. Um, and you could say almost fundamentally all Leica film cameras are the same, no matter if it's new like this or it's a different model, or it's old. The principle is the same almost as it has been since 1925. Um, but if you take this camera, it's a miracle <laughs> that, that they uh, have managed to make the same camera again. Um, and you could say that the M6 is already, uh, you could say, well, it's the second most popular film camera ever. The most popular was, was the M3, M4 uh, generations. Uh, so this one has really been used a lot by amateurs and enthusiasts and a lot of professionals. So you look through uh, photo history, there's a lot of famous photographs and prize-winning photographs and historic photographs they're taking with the M6. Uh, just go to the White House. Uh, all the way up till uh, when Obama became president. From Obama on, they kind of used uh, Canon and stuff and digital. But before Obama, uh, most White House photographs they used a Leica M6 because it's so quiet and it's compact. And that's one thing also that I appreciate again. I mean, of course, I do with digital. But I don't know what film is kind of like, oh, okay, I can just, I can just use the, the Ligaflex here. And the Ligaflex is bigger and it's a different story to work with this one where uh, a Leica M film camera is so compact and so simple and so lightweight, uh, it's unbelievable.
and you could say maybe if you really like this that you can study uh, cameras you can see oh it has this feature it has this and I can put on this and I can do this and I can do all this and you can put on a tripod and all this then uh, when you get out of your car and you have a like M6 or a shoulder with one lens it's just it's like having nothing and if you can appreciate that idea of it's just you looking at the world and then you have a camera to take a picture of of it but nobody's going to really look at your camera like wow that's an amazing camera what can it do it's just it's like you don't have a camera and that is uh, the beauty of the m6 or the Leica m film camera is that it's just so uh, compact and so sturdy and what else can i say well uh, if we take it here you could say the sound of it this is 1 25th of a second like this um, and the simplicity of shooting it is like no you have there's nothing that the camera is going to suggest a shutter speed uh, the m7 came later uh, and that is not as popular a model this is more a classic but the m7 actually have the auto uh, feature so it will suggest a shutter speed but this one just goes from one uh, uh, I can't even remember if it's one second, half a second, a quarter of a second, eight, one eighth of a second, and then all the way to one thousand of a second. Uh, and that's something you have to set. And then I said before, yeah, I use a light meter or I use the M11 to set the light. But actually, <laughs> once you pop in the battery here, what the battery does, and the only thing it does on this camera is when you look through it, then you have, once you press the shutter release a little bit, it lights, it turns on, and I think. It, the light meter goes off after 30 seconds or something like that and if you put the camera on B here which is also bulb bulb it when you press the shutter and then it, it stays open till you let go of it uh, but that also turns off the light meter so when you travel and stuff you put it on B so you don't have uh, the shutter release being pressed and you use all the battery on the light meter but in any case what happens is you put say here uh, I can say 1000 of a second and then you take the camera up and then you see uh, there's an arrow now so there's a red dot inside and there's a red arrow this way and a red arrow this way and the whole art is only the dot should be lit up uh, because that's the correct exposure if there's an arrow this way it means you turn the aperture this way if it goes this way it turns this way so what does that mean well it means that if it turns this way there's too much light and then you turn down the light by the help of the aperture and now it's correctly exposed and then you can take the picture. You could also say okay if that's the case then I'm, I'm just going to change the shutter speed because so here's 1000 so I can't really go higher but let's say I started with 125 and it says there's too much light go this way. I could also say no I want to stay at 1.4 with this lens so I'll just go uh, with uh, the shutter speed I'll make the picture darker by turning the shutter speed and there we are, that's the dot, now it's correct exposure. Um, in that way it's very simple, I would say so far, and that's very unlike me because I like to shoot my lenses wide open, but I'll basically just go, okay, I set it at whatever shutter speed, 1000 or 250, whatever I decide is the right for the type of light, and I'll just change the aperture. So with this, with film, I actually don't care if I take a picture at 5.6 because it's not really about narrow depth of field. If I wanted to play with narrow depth of field and foreign lines of film, I can put on uh, ND fillers, so it's like sunglasses for the lens. Uh, so you screw on this one and then this one is uh, a four stop, so this one would reduce the light uh, uh, with four stops. So that means if it's a 1.4 lens, it's like one stop, two stop, three stop, four stop. So now it would behave like a 5.6 lens, even it's wide open because it has a filler in front of it. So that's the way to do it, or else you could say, no, I'm going to go with, you could go with 50 ISO uh, slide film or black and white film. Just so you can go 3200, so you can adjust it there. But, it's, but that's part of the beauty here, it's like it's not really... It's kind of, I wouldn't say sloppy, it's just it doesn't really matter because I'm just taking a picture of this <laughs> and there's something about this scene that I like and right now I'm not really doing narrow depth of field with 0.95, 50 mm or something. Uh, I'm capturing some other colors or atmosphere or something. 
Uh, and then you can say, then you can expand into it, you can put on uh, the knock looks and work with narrow depth of field and so on. Uh, different story and then you kind of get back to where I was when I was shooting film, it's like uh, everything get measured and you do this and that and often it would be like, no I do one particular photo, a portrait or something with this film and I shoot the whole film on this person and then now I'm going to do something else, I put in a different film to do overview or something like that. So that's like uh, more of a production. Uh, what I'm talking about here is just like, no, I'm just walking around the street and taking pictures and it's like, yeah, it's morning, I put on a 400 ISO and maybe I shoot one film, maybe I shoot five films that day in daylight that are all uh, 400 and now I just change the settings here. Um, and then you could say I'll show you here, um, yeah, I do have a film in here and then it's very simple. You go here, you press this one, uh, now you can reverse the film or rewind, I guess it means, it's an R. And then you go here, whoop, there. And you could say, some say this is so small, it doesn't really matter, it's just like, uh, you get used to all this. And now I can feel and hear that it's uh, back in the box. And then I can take out the film here, and there it is, it's ready to send to the lab. And then I can put in uh, a new film, uh, but actually what I wanted to show you is uh, how simple it works. So one thing we have here, why it's called TTL, uh, through the lens. So that was the new thing in the Leica M6 when it came out, was that you have a right dot here on the shutter cursor. Um, and then there's an eye down here measuring how much light reflects from this one. So that means that if you put on here a 28mm lens, um, then if this is the frame, then this dot in here, this little thing, is whatever you point it at, it's going to measure the light in that area. Uh, very simple, but you suddenly, you didn't have to have an external light, meaning you didn't have to, to just guess what it is, you could actually measure the light. And you said the only thing there is with that is that any light meter, it doesn't matter if it's digital, video camera, iPhone, whatever, any camera's uh, light meter that measures the light sets the exposure, all the settings, based on that whatever it is, the area that you measure have to be mid-tone. It's also called 18% reflexive, but it's basically like middle gray. And it could also be middle red, but it's like... And the idea is that you take photos in a street, or you could say tourist photo, whatever, and you take a photo of a street, and you have blue cars, white cars, black and white stuff, and dark and bright. They're all, if you just blur the whole look, it's going to be mid-tone, it's going to be middle gray. So that's how light meters was made, that's, that's how we measure that if everything is just like this mid-tone, then the exposure is correct. And that is true in most cases, of course, if you go in snow, if you go in the mountain, you photograph in snow, there's so much light reflecting from the snow, so all your pictures can be on it, suppose, because the camera's light meter tries to make it mid-tone. And opposite, if you go into a dark uh, restaurant in the evening, the light meter is going to make it brighter than it is, or expose it, because it's trying to make this dark restaurant mid-tone. So that's where you have to think and think, no, uh, the light meter says this, I'm going to change it to this. Or you have just this little spot, you point it somewhere where you have a similar uh, surface. And then you measure the light from there, you set the light, and then you turn it back and you take the picture. So that is the TTL thing, is simply just the new thing back then that you can actually measure uh, the light in the camera. Um, brand new and it still works. And I don't need a light meter, I actually don't need to take my M11 with me. This uh, with the arrows in here works really well. And then you have here, uh, you put in the film. Here you can see it. And then once you put in the film, except I haven't put in the film in this one now, um, but you can see if I put it back here on bulb or B, then when I press the shutter, the shutter curtain that goes up and you can see, you can look straight through it and this way through and that's how the film is get exposed and that's how a shutter curtain works. And you say normally it would be maybe 125th of a second or something like that. So that's something like this. So it's going really fast. There you go. Uh, and listen to this, this decisive sound, it's just like 
uh, it makes uh, almost no sound. And let me just put in a film in this one for the fun of it uh, and see if I can fumble my way through this because uh, I haven't done it a lot and it's a long time. And there's one interesting thing uh, I actually didn't know. The manual says uh, you load the film here and then see then the mechanism here on this one is going to push the film down. So you're not supposed to rewind the film. And that's what I always used to put in the film. And then I took two or three pictures and just rewind and then it was like around there and then I was close to the whole thing. And here it actually says, no, that's not what you do. So you go here <coughs> and then you go here and then now you can take the first photo and you can rewind and take the next one and rewind. And then one thing I would look at over here is, uh, see what happens here. Um, so this one should actually follow and it doesn't. And I'll see if I did anything else wrong. And we see, so maybe it just wasn't following there, so try again now. Okay, now it's rolling. So that was an interesting thing, but it actually looks like it's a little bit elevated here. I'm a little bit uncertain about this. I did, never really looked at it like this before. But, so you could say that's right, what the manual says, that you don't have to rewind the film and take a picture, rewind, and then you close the camera. Uh, it's actually right. I never knew that. Uh, it's the first time I ever discovered with uh, like an M. I wouldn't say it makes a big difference, but you could say the way to check that the film is actually rewinding or moving forward is that you take a picture and then when you when you rewind here you will see this moves so the film is actually moving uh, and if you have taken a lot of film in, in, in uh, the past you have for sure tried to take a whole roll of film and discover that the film was still sitting over in the cassette it didn't move uh, and that is quite annoying so that's a thing just a lot of things you just get used to then you have here in the back, you have a uh, ISO setting. So this one, before I had 160 ISO film in, so now I'm going to change it to 400. Uh, and this one helps the light meter uh, calculate that now the light meter knows it's a 400 ISO film, so it can come up with the correct uh, suggestion for shutter speed and for aperture. And this one uh, is fine, it's made of plastic. There is, uh, all the versions of Leica where it's metal, doesn't really matter. One thing, the only thing you have to get used to is like you cannot just put the camera, well you can, but you put the camera like this, it actually rests on this one. Uh, and I used to do that, just put cameras like this, bump them down. So this one I just have to think one time extra or I'll put them like I often do with cameras like this. Um, and that's the simplicity of it. And I mean, it does have a hot shoe here, you can put in a flash, you can also, uh, take off this thing uh, and then you have here contact uh, this is really old school so you can put in a cable to flash and then they will go off uh, when they get a signal from the camera here uh, that's also you could say part of what the battery does it gives a signal to flashes and i think that is kind of the simplicity and then it has uh, yeah you have the focus mechanism that's the same on all Leica cameras so you look for this one and this one over here is the focus I and it's in contact with this one. So when this one moves, the focus moves, and the way the focus moves is that uh, you, when you turn the focus ring on the camera here, this piece of metal moves up and up and down, and that's the one that touches this one. Same principle in all Leica cameras, digital or whatever. And then you have also, uh, or here you have a range finder. Uh, uh, frame selector. So this one actually has three settings and it's click in place automatically. So when I look for this one, I have a 28 millimeter frame line outside the picture and then I have inside what must be a 90 millimeter <coughs> frame line. And when I put on a 50, I'm going to get 50 and 75 frame lines. And I have another one where I get 35 and 135 millimeter frame lines. Uh, and that's just something uh, you get used to that this is my 28 millimeter frame line and then you just know uh, where it is and you can see uh, this rangefinder viewfinder is a little bit different than this one you can see this one is bigger 
And that's one of the things that like I have improved, but I haven't changed it with the M6 is, and I mean, it works fine. You can say when I wear glasses, I cannot see a 28 millimeter frame line, but then I just move my eyes, look at this, you know, uh, just as <clears throat> when I look through here, a corner of the, of the viewfinder is covered by the lens, but it doesn't really matter because it's a ventilator, so I can see through the lens, but also I, I kind of look at this, so that's what's down there in that corner, and then uh, I don't have to concentrate about it. Um, <coughs> beautiful, simple camera, and uh, it's almost uh, indestructible, which is also why you can buy like an M6 uh, secondhand, and you can get them repaired, you can get them oiled and lubricated and adjusted and everything. Uh, in that sense, there's no reason to buy a new one, but I mean, it is irresistible. It's kind of like if they came out with a Volkswagen Beetle, the original one from 65, built exactly like 1965. I would buy one uh, the same instant. The same if IBM made a typewriter again, like the one they did in the 80s and 90s, and it was built exactly like it was that back then, but it came brand new. I would buy one of those too. Um, so that is the, the charm of uh, getting the camera uh, again, even you can get them secondhand and they work basically just as well. Uh, and then of course there's this extra feature with Leica is that they come up with something new and you can get it. So it doesn't matter how much money you have or anything, it's just no, they don't have anything so you'll have to wait two weeks, two months a year, uh, that's realistically right now 2 to 12 months wait on the M6. I mean, I wouldn't wait that long, I would just find a dealer somewhere in the world that doesn't have a long waiting list or whatever. There's always something lying around or somebody bought it and then they returned it and then the dealer have one camera the day you walk in and that's yours. So there's always a way to get it. Uh, you, could, <laughs> else there is. Uh, you go get a second hand. And there's lots of other Leica film cameras you can explore, just as there's many other Nikons. Once you get into this, it becomes a whole thing. And you can say one of the uh, relieving things about film is that the details, sharpness and all this BS, it doesn't really matter. It becomes much more about the image. Uh, and it's almost like if it's a little bit blurry, it's not totally razor sharp, it's actually, it almost makes it better. Um, and it's something, if you work with it, you can start think why, what, what is so great about film. And you could just, I actually found a, uh, a film picture and I have here. So this is uh, my daughter and my mother. So this is uh, probably 18 years ago. And this is uh, a uh, film photo that I scanned on the Imicon back then. I can see the grain here and you could say, I don't think the skin here is totally correctly exposed, but it is just a beautiful photo, a beautiful atmosphere, uh, and I even had to clean it up for hair and scratches and everything. Uh, but it's just something about film, and it's kind of like you go, uh, I also have a record player and I buy records again. I don't know why I sold my records of Italy, I had so many interesting ones, but I did. Uh, when the CD first came out, I thought, that's great, this is much better, I'll just change to this. But now, actually, uh, for a few years, I've been buying vinyl again, and I still like high-quality audio, and I'll stream it in high definition and blah de blah uh, But I also like to put on record because it's limited, it's only 20 minutes or something, then you have to change, uh, <laughs> turn the record around. It's, uh, it's dusty, sometimes you buy a record, it, it jumps like this, but it's very charming. Uh, and there is something about uh, going back in time, and you say that's basically uh, what you get to do with this. And I do think that there is an experience and a learning experience and, and possibilities to rethink how you do things and why you do think why you do things by uh, playing around with film. Either you get a uh, cheap uh, point and shoot film camera, or you go. Uh, real big time with the Leica M6, doesn't really matter. But just uh, going back, if I should say anything, the point is it's not that difficult. You can buy film uh, many places and you can find labs 
around the world that will do high quality developing and scanning, which means it's not the one 7-Eleven or something on the corner of Walgreens or something. You go find a real lab in London is Aperture, in New York is this lab and so on. So they do exist around the world, uh, labs that are really serious about this and are not uh, super expensive. Um, so maybe give it a go. That's all I had to say today about film and photography and Leica. Uh, remember below the video there's a link to uh, a free ebook and also to free uh, Leica presets so you can make uh, nice pictures in Lightroom and capture one. Till I see you the next time, remember to always wear a camera. Thank you.